Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission podcast. If you want your scariest work experience to be told on the show, send it to us at darkstories.org. And stop by eeriecast.com for more podcasts like this, or to support us by ordering some merch. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? I've been drinking my coffee and hot tea out of this cute little mug from the EerieCast merch store. It's got a tired little Wendigo on it, and it says, insatiable for coffee. <laughs> That's so me. Sadly, if I do have even one cup past the first, my intestines go Super Saiyan 3 and it's over for me. Oh hey, you're back. I'm about to go on my break, and I've got some new scary work stories to share with you. There will be disturbing emergency calls, terrifying overnight shifts, and more. Enjoy. These are tales from the break room. Working late. From Anonymous. Years ago, I used to work in a small IT department for a food company based in the northwest of the UK. We had standard nine to five hours located in the same office at first. But as the role changed, I started working all over the country, meaning early starts and late finishes weren't uncommon. The two incidents I'm about to tell you about occurred on a couple of those late nights. The first and far less creepy of the two incidents took place less than a year after getting the job. I was tasked with replacing the entire office's desktop PCs with new hardware. This was going to be a lengthy process, as there were well over 100 desks, so I decided to do it outside of office hours, so as not to cause any disruption to the rest of the staff. I was under the impression I was the only person in the building at the time. The place was actually owned by another much larger company, located just around the corner, which had on-site security 24-7. Company policy was they had to do one final walk around and lock up our building once everyone had gone home for the day. Their telephone number was displayed on the wall of the reception area to our building, next to a phone to call them on. The last member of staff out would give them a call, and they would turn up in their little security van a few minutes later. You generally knew if you were the last one on site, as each floor was essentially one big open office, and we only used the ground floor. The two floors above were for storage only. Anyone who regularly worked later than the rest knew the lockup drill. One night at about 11 p.m., I was nearing the end of the rollout, busily cabling a PC under a desk. That's when I heard what sounded like someone running across the floor above me. I practically jumped out of my skin, nearly hitting my head on the desk above me in the process. I quickly scrambled from under the desk and automatically looked up. As I did, the same heavy footsteps ran back in the opposite direction, starting at the very far end of the office, right back to pretty much directly above me. I stood there silently for a few moments, before thinking to myself, maybe someone else was working late too. It never occurred to me to ask the question as to why they were running, even though no one had ever mentioned to me they worked at this hour. This was the first time I'd worked into the evening, so I didn't really know for sure. I decided to go and check. I walked up the stairwell, the automatic lights flickered on, and I headed up. I opened the door to the first floor. Those from the US reading this would call it the second floor. It was in complete darkness. I slowly edged through the doorway, and this time, the main office automatic lights flickered on. There was nobody there. If there had been, the lights would have already been on, as they were activated by movement. I stood there for a moment, listening for any noise. Nothing. I felt so uneasy, I quickly turned back down the stairwell, grabbing my belongings. I decided to finish off the last couple of desks the following morning. I walked briskly to the reception area, called security, and never even mentioned it to them. At the time, I didn't really know them that well, and I had no wish to inform them of how creeped out I was. I know sometimes pipes and buildings can creak, 
but I worked many a late night in that office after that day, and I never heard anything like it again. The second incident that I experienced in that building happened a couple of years later. By this time, I'd worked late often enough that I'd gotten used to being there by myself. I'd also gotten to know the security team well enough, so much so we were on first name terms. I'd stored their contact telephone number in my mobile too. On the odd occasion, I would have to ask them to reopen the office for me if I turned up late from another site long after the last person had left the building for the day. This was one of those times. I turned up around 10 p.m., so I called security when I was close. They'd unlocked the main doors for me by the time I arrived, meaning it was just swipe access to get in. They were waiting for me in the car park, asking how long I would be in. I said I didn't know for sure, but probably two hours at the most. As I mentioned in the first story, each floor of the building was one big open office. The building was square in shape, but due to the canteen and toilets taking up the corner of the building, the main office was kind of L-shaped. The main door, which squeaked loudly, was at one end of this L, and my desk was around the corner on the other end of it, meaning I couldn't see the door from where I sat. My work that night had taken a lot longer than expected. It was around 12.30 a.m., I sat at my desk with the only office lights on being the ones above my pod of desks. If I remember correctly, there were about four light zones in total, meaning three quarters of the office was still in darkness, as the only movement to activate the auto lights in there at the time was me. It was then that I heard the loud squeak of the door slowly opening from around the corner. As this happened, I saw the glow of the automatic lights activating near the door. I'll admit, it made me jump a little, so I sat there, motionless for a few seconds, before calling out, Hello? Hello? I got no reply, and after about 10 or 15 seconds, the door slowly closed again. I then suddenly realized the time. It was 30 minutes later than when I told security I'd be done. They'd probably called over to make sure I was still there and hadn't sleepily left the site without letting them know about it. I remember smiling to myself, knowing this would be what had happened. I got up to greet them. But then, nobody appeared from around that corner, and none of the other lights in between the door and I had come on. Still amused with my own brief scare, I decided to go and meet security myself, Maybe they had just stood at the door, hadn't heard me or seen the lights from around the corner, and they decided to head back to the front door to lock it, locking me in for the night. I ran down the office to the door and into the corridor that connects the front foyer to the main office. But as I reopened the squeaky door, I realized the automatic lights down the corridor were activating as I passed below them. These things stay on for a good few minutes once motion is detected. So, how did security walk from reception without activating them only seconds earlier? Undeterred, I then went through all three sets of double doors on either side of reception and into the car park, expecting to see the security van leaving. But there was nothing. Confused, I walked back into reception, taking my phone out and calling security. Recognizing the incoming number, they picked up with, Hi mate, you about ready to leave? I replied, Uh, no, not quite. I was wondering, did you just send someone down to lock up the building? He answered, No, we're waiting for you to call. Oh, sorry, my mistake. I thought I saw someone arrive. I'll give you a call as soon as I'm done. I walked back down the corridor and through the squeaky door. As it closed behind me, I noticed how quickly it closed. I then remembered how long it had stayed open before when I shouted hello into the dark. Not only had it opened, but it had stayed open, like someone or something was holding it open. 
Trying to think of a rational explanation, I told myself it must have been a gust of wind getting through a gap in the reception doors or even through a window. Then I realized there are three sets of doors in between the outside and that door, and one of those is a well-sealed fire door. I also recalled all windows in that building are solid double glazed and none of them can be opened. They're all completely sealed. As I walked back to my desk, the hair on the back of my neck standing up, I felt very uneasy. I'm not gonna lie and say it felt colder or that I felt I was being watched, but something felt very wrong. Like in the first incident, I just grabbed my belongings and left the building as fast as possible. I got into my car, locked all the doors, and called security back, letting them know I was done for the night. That was the last time I ever worked late in that building. These two stories may not be as graphic or exciting as most I've heard, but they are 100% true and still make me feel like there is more to this world than we know. Pests from Holy Diver 32 I work in pest control, so I'm inside homes a lot. On one occasion, I arrived at a normal client's house, knocking on the door, but I didn't get an answer. I remember thinking, that's okay, he is normally sleeping at this hour. So, as usual, I just got started outside. As I walked around the house, I noticed dead flies in the windows and every once in a while, this putrid stench of rotten meat. At the end of my inspection, I knocked on the door again, but still I did not receive an answer. I called his children because I was worried. He normally likes to hold a conversation about how he's doing, either before or after my work. They gave him a call too, but they didn't receive an answer, and they asked me to go ahead and open the door to see if I could check on him. As soon as I opened the door, a wave of that same smell hit my face, decomposing flesh. It was so palpable, I had to go get a respirator out of my van. As I came back in, I noticed the power was out. The house was completely dark. There were flies all over, both dead and alive. I then saw him. He was sitting in his living room chair. He was covered in flies and unfortunately, he was dead. I froze. I then noticed where the flies were coming from. The power must have been out for a while. An elk the old man had hunted was inside a freezer bag in his freezer. So with the power being out, the bag of elk meat heated up. And combining with the decomposition, the freezer bag exploded, throwing open the freezer door and creating a source of food for the flies. I would have to come back to this house, trying to rid the place of these flies. It would take about three months before the smell was finally gone. I never told his kids what I actually saw. I just had a coroner come to remove the body. Once we were in the clear, I was able to disinfect the house. Sure, it's a short story, but it's a horrible memory altogether. It was the most unsettling thing I'd ever experienced on that job. Paranormal Park From Kin I worked at a state park to support myself while I was attending college due to its flexible schedule and the fact that the lodge front desk stayed open 24 hours a day. Since I was in college full time, I went to classes during the day. Then I would work after that from 3pm to 11pm, tending to the front desk of the lodge. Now, there was a quirk with this job. There was a local legend surrounding the mountain it was on. Supposedly, a certain bluff had a small ghost woman who haunted it. I'd heard variations of this story my entire life. In fact, on my first day, I was told that the lodge itself was also haunted, and the ghost there was named Mr. Mathers. I've never been much of a believer in the paranormal so I just took what they said with a grain of salt. I never experienced anything creepy myself for the first few months, but I did hear numerous stories, and I would eventually see some weird stuff 
which the park rangers had caught on game cameras throughout the summer. Once the winter rolled in, all the guests go home and the park becomes eerily quiet. That's when the ghosts come out to play. The first few run-ins I would eventually have with the supernatural were just things like brooms and fire pokers being knocked to the ground. Eventually, things would progress, and I would begin to hear little feet running about the lobby when I was the only one left in the building. A lot of noises I tried to explain away myself, just reminding myself that the lodge was built during the Great Depression. The buildings were old and were probably just making some weird noises due to that. Although I didn't let the things falling and footsteps scare me too bad, there was one particular incident that chilled me right to the core. That day was a weird one to begin with. It was mid-January, and we had been dealing with severe thunderstorms and power outages my whole shift, so the entire staff, including me, were frustrated, completely exhausted. The storms died down around 9.30 or 10, so right before my shift was about to be over, the lodge restaurant staff were finally able to close the kitchen down, and campers were able to safely go back to their sites. I was counting one of my cash drawers when an intoxicated, bewildered man came up to the front desk. He explained to me that he had just witnessed a man walk through the wall of the hallway in the lodge. I asked a few questions to make sure there were no other possible explanations, but he was certain he had just watched a man walk right through the wall into the locked meeting room. Of course, I was a bit taken aback because that room is never used and I didn't even have a key to access it. Now, I have been told that people have seen this before. That room used to be Mr. Mather's old office. I wanted to calm the situation, so I told this man that sometimes it's just a trick of the light and it makes it look like people walk through walls when really they just turn the corner of the hallway. My answers seemed to appease him, so he turned to go back to his room. As he walked away, a family came in frantically saying that they had just witnessed a little girl standing at the end of their bed. Back-to-back -back paranormal sightings. They had a little girl with them, so I asked if they were certain it wasn't their daughter. Maybe she got up to go to the bathroom, and they just happened to see her. They both firmly told me that she was in between them when they saw this other girl. They insisted that I call a ranger to make sure that their cabin had not been broken into. I went ahead and called a ranger, and as I was waiting for him, the kitchen staff were done closing everything down, and they were heading home. I told them goodbye and wished them a safe trip. Before long, the ranger arrived, and he took the frantic couple to their cabin to do a walkthrough. Finally, I had some peace and quiet. I was counting the cash register when I heard a door to the restaurant office close. Now, I was a little confused because, as I said, I just saw the restaurant staff close down and leave. I didn't go investigate, because I had tons of cash I had to keep an eye on, and after these last two sightings, I was honestly scared of what I might run into. I heard the door close again, then I heard the restaurant manager say, Hey, Kindog, which was my nickname that was exclusive to my coworkers. We carried on a conversation for a few minutes, then it was quiet again. I couldn't see the office door from where the cash register was, so I was used to blindly talking to coworkers from around the corner, and I didn't think too much of it. When the nighttime auditor came in, I went to go talk to the person who I thought was still in the office, the one I just had a whole conversation with. I turned the corner to go to the restaurant office, and the hallway light was off. I thought that was strange, but I went ahead and reached for the doorknob. My heart sank when I turned the knob, because the door was locked. I was thoroughly freaked out and beyond ready to go home. As I was quickly gathering my stuff, I got a message from the person who I thought I was conversing with only ten minutes ago, saying she didn't have power at her house. My heart nearly stopped. She lives 45 minutes away from where we work, 
There was no possible way that she could have been talking to me and made it home in only 10 minutes. I didn't tell the night shift worker what had happened because I didn't want to freak her out. However, the next night, I did tell the ranger about all the weird things that happened. He laughed at me and thought I was crazy, so he pulled up the security camera. Sure enough, you could see my coworkers leave. You could see me counting money and then see me having a full-blown conversation with whatever was behind that locked office door. I hated working alone after that, but nothing that creepy ever happened again. I would still hear the little footsteps and stuff falling on occasion, but no one ever directly addressed me after that night. My first 5150 from Anonymous. Several years ago, I got a job as an EMT. The company I worked for serviced LA, Orange, and Riverside counties. It was a medium company, and they were always trying to win contracts with the local fire department. This meant all the 911 calls the preferred EMT companies didn't want went directly to us. On my very first day while working for this company, I was stationed in my home county of Orange. The area we were covering was somewhat familiar to me, so navigating around wasn't too hard. Around 6 p.m., yes, I remember the exact time, we received a 5150. A 5150, for anyone who doesn't know, is what the healthcare industry refers to as a mentally ill patient, such as schizophrenics, bipolar, or anyone who might be a danger to themselves or others. As we approached the fire department, the police were already there talking to the patient and her brother, who was the one who called. The firefighter paramedic approached us and gave us a report of what happened. The patient was diagnosed as 5150, but no specific details of what illness she was diagnosed with. That was interesting, since nearly all mentally ill patients have one kind of specific description. This one, and for the rest of my career, was the only one with an unknown 5150 on her chart. As we pushed the gurney over, I saw her, but since it was dusk, it was hard to make out many details. She was a 52-year-old woman who was living alone. Her brother would check up on her daily and make sure she was taking care of herself and also maintaining her medications as well as hygiene. However, for the last seven days, he was unable to reach her by phone. He'd been out of town due to work and couldn't drive over to her house to check. From what he said, there have been times where he hasn't heard from her but usually it's two or three days before she answers the phone. This time, it seemed unusual that she would be silent for more than that. He did call for a welfare check. The police arrived, but she wasn't answering the door. They called and asked him if they could enter the home. He gave them permission and they entered. The firefighter reported that when the police entered the house, it felt like the air conditioning was running full blast. It was super cold to the point they could see their breaths. Normally, during this time, the weather is quite cool and running the air would be mostly pointless. As they continued their search, they went down to the basement of the house. The neighborhood was very old, with many of the homes built during the early 20th century. After the 1940s, homes in California were no longer built with basements due to earthquakes breaking foundations of homes. So having a basement was rare, but it wasn't unusual. They found her standing near her washer and dryer, just standing there motionless. They called out to her, and she responded, asking them if they were going to, well, assault her. The police then took a closer look. They found injuries on her face and arms. That's when they called the fire department, the firefighter and police officer walked her over to our gurney. They assisted us with strapping her wrists and ankles to make sure the restraints were secure enough for transport. Since it was still dark out, even though there were lights on from the street and the emergency vehicles, I still couldn't see her injuries that well. We loaded her into the back of our rig, and since I'm new, 
yep, I was the one who had to ride in the back with her. I climbed into the back and turned on the lights to see her more clearly. She had massive scratch marks across her forehead, cheeks, chest, and forearms. Each of these scratches were deep and in marks of three. They were large, much larger than her own nails. What I found very odd was the lack of blood. These scratches did not look superficial. They looked like an attack from a mountain lion or bear. However, there was no wild animal in sight, no indicator that an animal had been nearby. She suddenly turned to me and asked if I was a B word or an R word that rhymes with escapist. Oh well, I thought I've been called worse. I started to perform a head to toe exam on her to see if there were any additional injuries. As I looked in her eyes, I noticed she had completely black colored eyes. It looked as if her pupils were completely dilated. It struck me kind of odd that her eyes would be like that. There were no other signs or symptoms of her having narcotics or any other stimulant in her system. She was calm for the most part too, but her presence was creepy. I began to ask her questions, and as usual with some patients, she was defiant in answering them. As we rode to the nearest hospital, she called out my name and asked if I was going to kill her. What caught me off guard was that I never gave her my first name, and there was nothing in the back that had my name labeled, and my name had never been spoken out loud with the police officer or fireman. Not to mention at that point, the back of the rig was getting super cold. I told my partner to shut off the air, but he replied that the air wasn't even on. Sure enough, it wasn't, and the lights, even though they were fully on, seemed like it was getting dark. I started getting goosebumps and a little scared being alone in the back with her. Eventually, we arrived at the ER and we were guided to a bed to put her on. Once we set everything up, I noticed that the restraints we had put her in were no longer attached to her at all. As a matter of fact, they disappeared. They'd been lost somewhere along the way. This freaked me out. I know for a fact I saw those restraints on her the entire time. I didn't say anything about it, and I guess my partner didn't really notice. The hospital staff had their own restraints they put her in as she lay there. As we were just leaving, I heard what sounded like a growl, a low guttural growl, and it was coming from her. This sound was very animal-like. When I looked back, I saw her staring at me with those dark eyes in such a menacing way. I just turned around and went back to the rig. As I was cleaning the back, I searched for the restraints that were missing, but I couldn't find them anywhere. As we drove off, I didn't think much about it until we slowed down at a red light. Once our rig came to a complete stop, something rolled from the roof to the front of the window. The restraints. Somehow all four restraints were on top of our rig. Neither me nor my partner had any idea how they would have gotten up there. That freaked both of us out. I took the restraints and I threw them away in our hazmat bin and we moved on to the next call. After that, maybe a few months and a year later, I would begin to have vivid nightmares with her in them. She was clothed, but her face was completely demonic, throwing insults at me and gnashing at me with her teeth. It was the strangest and one of the scariest calls I can remember. Not all the meek are mild. From Emma D. It was midsummer, 1990. I was working almost full time at the local university as a student helper during the summer. I learned how to type technical papers for the professors. I made copies, I ran errands. I liked the job. I'd been there for almost three years. My mom worked a few floors down from me in the engineering college and her carpool rider had gotten me the job upstairs in the aerospace engineering department. The carpool rider, let's call her Gladys, was very gruff and sometimes rude. 
but I think deep down she was a good soul. I think she put up with me because my mom was her ride, and she didn't drive, didn't want to take the bus. She was pretty unpleasant though, and I think it got under her skin some of the professors would come to me to process their technical papers. One of the professors, Dr. White, brought me all his correspondence and called me Kid. When I'd been working for them for only a few short months, a member of the office staff named Eileen transferred to another college on campus. Gladys hated Eileen, and the feeling was mutual. Gladys spoke smack about her constantly on the ride home. That was usually when my headphones went in, and the volume went up, and my eyes closed. They'd begun looking for Eileen's replacement immediately, and finally, the university HR department had acquired a substantial pool of applicants for the opening, and the department head, Dr. Demetrius, chose one. Monday I was taking a summer course, so when it was over, I headed to work, and when I opened the door, I saw her, the new hire. She was sitting at the front desk, and didn't even look at me when I came in. Rather, she quickly turned even more sideways away from me, and busied herself with some sort of document, which she was processing for a professor. She was a mousy, pale woman. Her hair was light brown, and looked to suffocate her features. She wore rose-colored frame glasses, almost as big as her face. They had to have been outdated, maybe circa 1979. She wore a ruffled, cream-colored, high-necked blouse. I caught the shadow of some kind of necklace underneath the fabric. It was kind of large and dark. I couldn't really make it out. It was weird that she didn't wear it on the outside. Anyway, she was ordinary. Then I noticed her desktop. It was surrounded by a barricade. The document folder was front and center. Phone books, supply catalogs, and binders were stacked high. Her purse was used to close the gap where her computer sat. Strange, yes, but to each their own. My prying eyes and raised eyebrow went to Gladys, and she did a quick, crazy motion with her index finger pointing at her ear. I widened my affirming eyes back at her, then went to go sit down to get started on Dr. White's latest proposal, which he was working on to get a grant. Uh, Emma, this is Alice. Alice Meeks. She's the new word processing specialist, too, to finally replace Eileen. For some reason, she had emphasized the word, too. Alice still sat with her back to the both of us. I shrugged and said, Um, hi, Alice. Nice to meet you. In return, I received a barely perceptible side glance and a head nod. Then back to the keys, she went. Tuesday. Things had grown more tense, colder, just uncomfortable. Alice was just, well, to put it nicely, weird. There was a new barricade. The desk drawers were pulled entirely out. Gladys got up to head out for a minute and saw the mailman coming down the hall. Alice, mail's going to be here in a minute if you don't mind sorting it out real quick. Thank you. I have to run down the hall and I'll be right back, she said quickly, then hurriedly slipped out the door. I glanced over at Alice when I heard her wrists slam down hard on the keyboard. She turned, glaring at me, and said in a very low growl, I'm a word processing specialist too, not a mail clerk. It's bad enough I have to answer the phones. She stood up slowly, almost menacingly, and she about tripped herself on the outstretched desk drawers. Her face grew redder by the second. Then she pushed those drawers in so hard, the desk nudged forward a good inch. An office supply catalog slid off, hitting the floor with a smack. Then she stopped. She pressed her hair with her hands, then held one pale hand over that weird necklace under her blouse. She stroked it almost lovingly a few times. Yes, she said to no one. Yes, I, I will be calm. You always calm me when I'm angry, my prince. She was almost in a zombie-like trance. She proceeded to the mailroom and methodically put the few pieces of mail in the appropriate boxes. When the phone rang, I jumped sky high, then answered it, grateful for the distraction. 
Gladys came back in, seeing Alice had put the mail away, and thanked her. She gave no response. Wednesday. It has hit the fan today. Ben, a graduate student working on his dissertation, was one of the funniest, sweetest people I'd ever met. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He was one of those that would go out of his way to hold the door or elevator open. Very thoughtful. He was working on his doctorate and as such needed someone to help type up his dissertation. He was so close to getting his PhD. He'd come into the office greeting everyone as he normally did. He always told jokes, usually cheesy ones. He asked Alice if she minded helping him a little bit after hours and said please. Maybe till 6.30? He even offered to buy her some dinner. She spun around in her chair. Her eyes sparked. No, I will not. I work from 8 to 5. I work Monday through Friday. I get an hour for lunch. Haughtily, she stood up. You're just a graduate student. She spat those words out like a bad taste. You can't bribe me with food. I have to go home and feed my mother. She's... A pause. She's unwell. Her hand clutched at that necklace under her shirt. It was then that I could see it, maybe? Not sure, but it looked like a pentagram. Or maybe a weird flower. Ben jerked back, as if her words had physically slapped him. His face turned red and his jaw clenched. I'd never seen this look on Ben before. He had every right to be upset, though. Um, he started and blinked hard. Gladys stood up and looked angrily at Alice, then turned and looked softly at Ben. He was still reeling from the verbal assault. If Emma and her mom don't mind, I can help you. And you don't need to feed me, just bring me a cookie tomorrow. I'd never seen this side of Gladys. I suspected she had a good soul. I think she'd had enough of Miss Meeks. I turned my PC off. I'll go downstairs and let them know. She'll be fine with it, I know it. Just get us all cookies, no problem. While waiting for Gladys, I decided to sit outside on the quad and take in the late afternoon sunshine. I looked up and I could see Gladys was going off about the whole thing with Alice and Ben. I could see her hands gesturing wildly and her mouth working double time. The closer she got, the more I could hear the conversation. She refuses to answer the phone says it's not her job. She's a word processing specialist too, don't you know? Phones and mail? Nope. Not her responsibility. She also won't speak to anyone coming through the door, especially grad students. Poor Ben. Bless his soul, he didn't deserve that. Apparently, Gladys had had enough of Alice and was going to meet with Dr. Demetrius in the morning. Thursday. Because class had been cancelled, I was due to work the whole day. 8 to 5. God, I didn't want to sit in there all day with that crazy woman. I really didn't, but at least I could be a buffer for Gladys. As the day dragged on, Alice became more and more withdrawn. She mumbled the same chant slowly, softly, all the while rocking back and forth. She refused to answer the phone and her old protest about the mail droned on. Ben had not stepped one foot back in the office, and the professors did not come in once for coffee. The office atmosphere had taken a decidedly different turn. I blamed that cold feeling on the air conditioning. Gladys said she had to stay a little late to talk to Dr. Demetrius. Alice's back stiffened, then relaxed. Her rocking and mumbling continued. Gladys and I shot a quick, wide-eyed glance at one another. I responded quickly, letting her know that I would let my mom know. Gladys responded back with, Yeah, it's something he wants to talk to me about. A nervous giggle? Wonder what I did now. I'm always getting into trouble. Friday Gladys and I sat nervously waiting for Alice to come out of Dr. Demetrius' office. Alice was probably going to be fired today. She had gone into the office, quietly, still mumbling the same indiscernible phrase as yesterday. 
This time, the necklace she'd concealed under her blouse was laying over the top. I noticed for sure it was a heavy black pentagram on a silver chain. She rubbed it as if trying to get power from a genie's lamp. A few moments of silence, then the conversation started to heat up. It became louder and louder, but it was not Dr. Demetrius. This was Alice. Alice was no longer meek. Finally, the office door burst open and out flew Alice. Dr. Demetrius stood mutely in the doorway of his office. She was red-faced, and her eyes sparked full of anger. She stopped cold, glaring at Gladys and at me, then shouted, You have no idea what I'm capable of, what I could do to each of you. Her arms were outstretched towards the ceiling. She was swaying back and forth. My prince is on my side. She clutched the pentagram again. Then she looked back down and at us with hatred. And you, the pair of you, you're nothing to him. In a rage, she began shoving things off her desk. Her coffee cup, a white ceramic mug she had brought with her, shattered to the floor. She grabbed her purse with an audible huff. The phone then rang. I looked at Gladys, she at me, then back to Alice. And I'm not going to get that, she raged as she stalked towards the door. She hovered there for a moment, then added in a low voice with her left hand outstretched towards us, I've put a pox on all of you, all of you, I will be back. Then she slammed the door with a bang. Dr. Demetrius stood there, dumbfounded. None of us knew what to say. He slowly bent down to begin picking up the shattered remains of the coffee cup. Emma, I'm sorry you had to see that, he said apologetically. Not sure what she's going to do, if anything. I'll pay you for the whole day, but I want you to leave. In case, you know. I need to call campus police now. Thank you. He then disappeared back into his office. I looked at Gladys. That was unexpected, but go on, dear. We'll see how things go on Monday. I need to have a smoke. I stood there shocked to my core. I thanked them both, mumbled something about it not being their fault, and to be safe, and I headed downstairs. I've only ever read or heard of this kind of workplace nut buttery, but here it was, and I'd experienced it firsthand. Follow up. I heard through the university administrative staff grapevine, Alice had somehow been placed in another position on campus, working the facilities management department. She was now on the janitorial staff. The only processing she does now was the garbage. Somehow that is fitting. Hospital Night Shift, Crying Entity, from Evie. I work at a hospital in England. My ward specializes in postnatal maternity services, and in some cruel ironic twist of life versus death, the maternity department is next to the morgue. I was on a night shift a couple of weeks ago. I needed to take a piece of equipment downstairs to the NICU, which involves me coming off my ward into the hospital hallways, turning the corner towards the morgue and letting the lift down. As I left my ward, I heard footsteps walking away from me and around the corner where the lifts are. I think nothing of it, because staff and patients alike can walk around at night. I rounded the corner to the lift, and I saw no one there. That's fine, I thought. Maybe they were quick and got out of sight. If anything, I'm pleased, because it's 4ish AM by then, and I didn't really want to talk to anyone. I stand by the lift call it and wait. Then I start to hear crying coming from the lift shaft, quite gentle and sad, like someone who had just heard some bad news. I know it sounds awful, but I sighed out loud to myself because I knew when the lift doors opened, I would be confronted with a crying staff member or patient and I would have to console them. Once again, I know it sounds terrible. I truly love my job and I love people and patient care. 
but in that moment, all I wanted was some peace in my ward. As the lift began coming up to my floor, the crying sounds grew louder. The lift bell dinged, and I was prepared for the doors to open and face me against the crier. But of course, as I'm sure you could have already guessed, the doors opened to no one. The sound had stopped. If I thought I was a brave person before, I certainly changed my mind then. My legs felt weak underneath me, and my stomach dropped. I stared at the empty lift for what felt like minutes, but realistically was only about 10 seconds. I had to actually lean on the equipment and use the wheels to force myself to walk into the lift, wherein I stood in the back corner and held direct eye contact with the security camera my whole ride. I then, of course, took the stairs back up. I know it seems so small and such a nothing experience, but truly, in that moment, I was sick with fright. My Work Doppelganger From Anonymous I worked at a small dog rescue in Chicago, Illinois about a decade ago. I loved the job passionately. About a year or two into working there, my long-term boyfriend and I broke up. I had to decide whether to stay in Chicago or move back to New York, where I was from. It was a very stressful situation and a very difficult decision. The dog rescue managers were willing to promote me if it meant I would stay. I was very attached to the job and the dogs, so I was torn about what to do. For the last couple of months spent at my job, my coworkers began seeing me when I wasn't there, or seeing me in places I shouldn't be, because I was elsewhere on the property at the time. I began receiving texts like, Hey, I thought today was your day off. Just saw you, but where did you go? But I would be sitting at home. It became a whole ongoing phenomenon. People would see me silently walking around, doing dishes, walking into little closets or spaces, which I usually didn't go into. One time, two colleagues of mine followed me into the closet containing a water heater, and when they arrived into the space just behind me, they discovered it empty. This thing that looked like me never spoke to anyone, nor did it look at them. One time, I walked into the back door entrance, which was the main adoption room floor full of dogs. That room had another entrance opposite the back door, and that entrance led into the hallway and kitchen area. As I entered the back door from outside, a colleague was opening the door to the hallway opposite me. She screamed out and said, what the heck? And retreated back into the hallway. She came back out, yelling that she had just seen me in the kitchen to her left, opened the door in front of her, and saw me walking into the dog room from outside. She was seeing me in two places at once. When she screamed and went back into the hallway where the kitchen door was, there was nobody in the kitchen. This happened in about five seconds flat. They continued to see this doppelganger, even after I moved back to New York. The only sense I can make of it is that the stress I was under about which direction to go with my life somehow created some ethereal version of me. Maybe because two realities were playing out in my head all the time. One where I stayed there and one where I returned to my home state. A sort of alternative version of me was existing in that space. I really don't know. I've heard of other doppelganger tales where the person was stressed and then people began seeing a phantom version of that person. That building was haunted anyway. We all heard a female voice singing and whispering while we were alone. Others saw a man in a flannel shirt. They'd see him in mirrors or out of the corner of their eye, and then he'd disappear. Perhaps the building itself was just configured somehow for a paranormal activity to exist. I guess I'll never really know. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. 
Tales from the Break Room is an eerie cast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com. <laughs>